Welcome to Talking Human Rights, a program where we discuss hot human rights topics of the day. And today we'll be discussing the Human Rights Act and UK government plans to scrap it. And here to do that with me is Kevin Lowey, legal advisor at Redress, uh, which is a UK human rights organisation that helps torture victims obtain justice and reparations. Kevin, welcome to the programme. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, Kevin, we've just had a general election in the UK, and one of the first things that the new Conservative government said was that they want to abolish the Human Rights Act. And I suppose the first question is, what is the Human Rights Act? The Human Rights Act is a piece of uh, UK legislation which came into force in 2000. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually an act passed two years before, in 1998, but it only came into force in the year 2000. And in essence, and the way it was described at the time, yeah. was that it was bringing uh, the European Convention on Human Rights home. Now, what was meant by that was that it was effectively incorporating um, some very important um, basic human rights uh, principles which had been developed in Europe immediately after the Second World War. Yeah. Um, what happened was the European Convention on Human Rights was signed up to by um, a number of European countries in the early 50s, including the UK, and a mechanism was set up for those rights to be enforced um, by what was originally the um, European Commission and then became the uh, European Court on Human Rights. But it was quite a complicated procedure uh, to begin with to, to make those rights um, directly and uh, applicable in the UK. Yeah. So the Human Rights Act was a very good idea. It made the convention rights very clearly um, part of UK law so that courts, when they were considering an issue, a case, mm -hmm. could refer directly to those rights as if they had been, um, uh, as if they were rights in, um, in UK law. Right. Okay. It was a very progressive um, move from a human rights point of view. Right. Okay. Now, why then, why then does the Conservative government want to get rid of this piece of legislation? Well, according to their own manifesto, as you've said, there's just been an election and they now are in power and there's been quite a lot of discussion already in and out of Parliament, but in their manifesto, and I've, I've actually got it in front of me here, um, what they said they wanted to do and will do is scrap the Human Rights Act and replace it with a British Bill of Rights. Yep. Um, and they say this will restore common sense to the application of human rights in the UK. Now when, when you actually look further, uh, they do give some examples of what they're unhappy with. They, they say that the um, Human Rights Act, by bringing in the European Convention on Human Rights mm -hmm. has resulted in um, what they call mission creep. It will reverse, I'm quoting here from the manifesto, yeah. it says, um, if they scrap the Human Rights Act, it will reverse the mission creep that has meant human rights law being used for more and more purposes and often with little regard for the rights of wider society which is a, a, a generalisation, and then they try to make it a bit more concrete. Among other things, the, the bill will stop terrorists and other serious foreign criminals who pose a threat to our society from using spurious human rights arguments to prevent deportation. Right. So that's one clear um, allegation that they make. Yeah. Whether one agrees with us or, you know, whether it stands up to any analysis mm -hmm. is another question. If we are going to scrap the Human Rights Act and replace it with another set of rights, some people might argue that we, we end up with 
human rights protections anyway. Would it be fair to apply that kind of logic to, to, to this debate? That look, if we got rid of the Human Rights Act and replaced it with a British Bill of Rights, we still end up with human rights protections. So what's the fuss? You may be right. It may be a, a, a distinction without a difference, um, so to speak. I think there are a number of different elements here. There's the actual rights involved, and then there's the role of the European Court um, in uh, uh, making decisions which then impact on the UK. Yeah. Just, just to go back a bit, because this is unfortunately not always clear in these political arguments that are going on. Um, some people would say that the present government is really using this whole thing as a bit of a political football, yeah. and that it's part of a wider kind of anti-EU, anti-immigration right. um, uh, posturing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, a more um, serious analysis um, argues that there's nothing wrong with the rights in the European Convention, yeah. but that there is um, some disquiet about the European Court having the final um, uh, right to make decisions relating yes, to, yeah. to something that happened in the UK. Because what used to happen was that the House of Lords, now the Supreme Court, was the final court in this country. Um, but even before the Human Rights Act, you could then, once a case had been decided by the Supreme Court, you could still take it to the European Commission yeah. and later the European Court. But you couldn't argue those issues in the Supreme Court. So right. effectively what happened was you'd argue something all the way up to the Supreme Court as if the European Convention didn't exist. Yeah. Um, if you were unhappy with the final result on this human rights issue, you could then go to the European Court, who would make a decision. Yeah. But you'd already be starting again, as it were. Right, right. Um, and that decision would then not be um, binding in a clear way on the UK, mm -hmm. but the UK would be expected to you know, take okay. it into account right. and to comply and to, and to right. you know, give some sort of effect to it. Yeah. But it was a very, um, it was very much a two-stage theory, uh, a process. Yeah. yeah. So it's important to understand the, the, the background. So under the Human Rights Act, so since 2000, from the start, if you begin a case in the High Court, mm -hmm alleging you, you, for example, are going to be deported to a place yeah. where you're going to be tortured, yeah. um, you can rely immediately on the European Convention and you can say um, your rights under the Convention are going to be breached and the court has to look at those, look at the previous decisions and, and, and bring those rights directly into the process from yeah. the beginning. Yeah. And you still go all the way up through the different the levels. Yeah to the Supreme Court, but at all those stages you, you're able to argue from this more fundamental um, European Convention right. point of view, right. and then you can go finally to the European Court itself. Yeah. Okay? And again they then make the final decision which the UK is meant to abide by. So, if the Human Rights Act is abolished yeah. and replaced with a Bill of Rights, it's not entirely clear, or it's not clear at all, what the process would be, because the European Convention would still be in force. Yeah. Um, you could still go back, or you could still go to it eventually, like you did yeah. Yeah. before 2000. Yeah. Um, but probably more importantly, you know, what would be contained in the Bill of Rights, if it's all the same rights that are already there in the European Convention, yeah. then the only difference is that you, um, you, you know, you're not going to be able to rely 
on the European Convention um, rights in the same way. Right. It, 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 unfortunately, it's not at all clear really what the impact will be, mm -hmm. um, which makes some people say that it's all just um, a, a bit of a subterfuge. Because the only way you could um, cut the European court out of the whole process yeah. would be for the UK to withdraw from the European Convention. Now that's a different right. issue. Okay. okay. And that's also, and that's part of why, why, unfortunately, the debate becomes a bit fuzzy because some people talk about the Human Rights Act yeah. and the European Convention as the same thing. They they now, do entirely different things. Yeah. You, you, you raise another important uh, uh, aspect uh, to all of this, uh, uh, Kevin, which is that, uh, which is the whole question of the UK withdrawing altogether from Europe. We know that there, is, uh, there are discussions uh, sure. by politicians to, for a referendum on, 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 on this whole question. Yes. Do you see the UK going that far as to pulling out of Europe? All together. My own personal um, view and hope is that um, the referendum will result in a, in a no. Yeah. Um, from a legal uh, rights point of view, yeah. um, I think it would be a, a tragedy if the UK withdrew from the European Union. That yeah. would be the worst possible right. um, scenario. A, a less um, uh, serious but equally uh, appalling yeah. um, uh, development would be that the UK stays within the European Union but withdraws from the European Convention on Human Rights. Whether it can actually do that, stay in the EU and withdraw from yeah. the Convention, yeah. is itself quite a complicated right. issue. Right. Um, but it probably could to a degree, it could put so many reservations and so on around yeah. things and generally cause a lot of confusion. Right. Um, that, that would be very bad. And the sort of least bad but still um, re, you know, reactionary development would be to scrap the Human Rights Act. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, I would, I would see it, if, if I may, um, like this. Um, we had the Second World War, yeah. which was the, the most horrendous um, example of, of you know, m people's inhumanity yeah. to people. Yeah. Out of that, some very important institutions developed and principles, beginning with the United Nations, yeah. the Euro the uh, Remind me what it's called, the Declaration of Human Rights. Universal, 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 Universal Declaration, Declaration of Human Rights. Of Human Rights yeah. and so, on. Yeah. so that was international. Mm, yeah. And then at the European yeah. level, where of course the war started and, yeah. and, and, and spread, mm -hmm. um, European states, led by the UK, the UK was very involved yeah. in setting up right. um, mm -hmm. not only the uh, European Convention, yeah. um, but, but these other. Council of Europe and other institutions, yeah. although it only joined the EU later, right, um, right, right. you know, to protect Europeans and yeah. people living in Europe. Yeah. I'm using Europeans in that sense, yeah. people yeah. resident in Europe, to give them this extra protection. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't see how you can have too, ma too, ma too many human rights. I okay. mean, you, 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 <laughs> It's a misunderstanding of, of, of the whole thing to say, you know, um, you know human rights are, are, are getting out of hand. Right, right. Basically what that means is, is that they've been wrongly interpreted or, or, you know, but the right not to be tortured, for yeah. example. Yeah. You know, even the Tory government are not saying that should be um, abolished. Yeah. yeah. The right not to be deported to a place where you may suffer torture. Right is a bit less clear when they start, you know, saying human rights are being used wrongly to protect terrorists yeah. from raising spirit, you, you know, yeah. basically yeah. that's what they're saying. So I would disagree with all of that right. and say that the, um, the European Union has been a, a good thing, the European Convention has been an excellent thing, 
the Human Rights Act has been of great benefit. No, it's, it's absurd to focus on you know, uh, terrorist suspects yeah. and, yeah. and, and uh, people like that. It's been used to protect many ordinary British people. There have been very important decisions relating to the rights of, um, of uh, elderly people right. to, um, when they are put into care homes, for example. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. For, for a husband and wife to, be, to have the right to be put into the same, same care home. Yeah. I yes. mean, yeah. you know, it's, it, I would say it's outrageous for somebody to say, well, that, you know, that's wrong. Mm. And yeah. if it wasn't for, you know, the only reason we have to do that now is because, you know, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. just bankrupt. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, Kevin, what, what, what risk is there then for international human rights if governments, like the UK government is attempting to do, if governments can be seen to be wanting to pull back, you know, um, as you described it, you know, there has been enormous strides over the last 40, 50 years as far as uh, human rights are concerned. So when a government like the UK government comes out and says, look, we are not happy with this set of human rights, what risk is there then for this whole notion of universal human rights? You know? I, think, I think it's a serious risk. I think there's, and, and it, it works on two different but related levels. The first risk is, is obviously for, the, for us, you yeah. and me, yeah, right, uh, and, yeah. and, and everybody else um, yeah. living in this part of the world, we're mm -hmm. going to have less protection from okay. abuse by the state, yeah. right. Right. which yeah. makes me very unhappy. Mm -hmm. um, so at that level, it's it's um, it's, it's worrying. But the, there's another dimension, and that it sets a very bad example to the world at large. Um, let me put it this way, the, the UK is a democracy, yeah. um, there is accountability and, and, rule of law. and the rule of law and yeah. all these things which, which um, are you know, hugely important. Yeah. Um, and uh, the UK is one of the leading democracies um, along with other states in Europe yeah. and other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. okay. um, now if it starts backpedaling, yeah. that is not going to help the wider um, struggle for international human rights because less democratic states will say, well, if the UK can, can do this, yeah, yeah, then yeah. what we can do, th right. that or worse. Right. Right. And linked to that is it undermines the UK's own um, moral uh, high ground position. The UK can't as easily put pressure on other countries yeah. to say, look, yeah. sorry, you know, we, we, we like you, you're our ally, or whatever, but we think what you're doing is wrong, and you know, through the United Nations or through all these many um, multilateral yeah. uh, bodies yeah. these days, to have that voice, right. it, it, it's 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 isolating itself, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. and will be taken less seriously in the in the international human rights. Um, movement. So that is, 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 is an added um, yeah. problem, or would be. Now, one of the things that we've, we've seen as far as opposition to these government plans has been um, mobilization of um, human rights NGOs, if you like, uh, and activists uh, who have said, no, to scrapping the Human Rights Act in the UK. Now, what role do you see for the human rights NGO movement in stopping these government plans, if they can? I think the, um, the civil society sector, or the NGO sector, yeah. uh, has an important role here, and I think it's been very active already I think there are a number of um, NGOs, one can think of Liberty, for example, yes, yeah. which is leading um, the, the campaign to, to keep the Human Rights Act. Yeah. Um, others, like Amnesty International, you know, big, powerful, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. credible human rights organizations yeah, yeah. have spoken out. Um, 
speaking from redress point of view and, and others, other NGOs with, with narrower or more, more focused mandates, yeah. um, I'm quite sure that, um, for example, there are some NGOs who focus, say, on freedom of expression. Yeah. So they will be um, um, campaigning or advocating for the retention of uh, the Human Rights Act because it's important for you know, freedom of expression yeah, yeah. And, and so on. Our mandate, redress's mandate, as you said at the beginning, is justice for torture survivors. So yeah. our concern specifically would be if the Human Rights Act is um, scrapped, what impact um, could that have mm -hmm. on torture survivors? Right. Right. Um, and we've, you know, we've gone on record and, and we'll continue to go on record that, you know, that we would regard it as a negative development which could well impact on torture survivors. And the, the way we, we argue it is if you actually look at some of the cases that were successful under the present right. system. Yeah. And, and there's a number of very important cases, um, some of which are well known. I'll, I'll, I'll refer to just one, mm -hmm. um, and that's um, the cases relating to uh, what was effectively torture right. being committed by some British soldiers yeah. against Iraqi uh, civilians in Iraq yeah. um, in 2003. Mm -hmm. There was this whole big scandal about yeah. um, 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 Baya Musa, which a lot of people might recognize the name. But in essence, what happened was that um, uh, British soldiers uh, tortured to death and, and tortured other, uh, a number of civilians, yeah. Iraqi civilians, in a military detention centre. Right. The, um, the Royal Military Police and others investigated it and yeah. found that um, you know, there, there was nothing more that needed to be done. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. This was challenged by UK lawyers under the Human Rights Act, under the European Convention, yeah. which says that when there's a death or an allegation and evidence of torture or whatever yeah. by the state, there yeah. has to be a proper inquiry. Right. And there's all standards. Yeah. It's got to be transparent, yeah. effective, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. prompt, the families have to be involved. Right. Right. Yeah. All kinds of things which you don't find in ordinary, as I put it like that, English common law. Yeah. Okay. So, and as a direct result of being able to use the Human Rights Act and the European Convention, this led to the whole event being blown open. Mm -hmm. And there was a Biomusa inquiry, um, and, and, and it became very clearly established in UK law okay. yeah. that um, when something like this happens, in those circumstances, yeah. the UK has very clear obligations right. which go way beyond some kind of military inquiry by the military police. Yeah, yeah. So, quite complicated sort of set of, of facts in a way, but the idea is, 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 is I think, quite clear that um, if the Human Rights Act was scrapped, mm -hmm. and even worse, if the European Convention was um, withdrawn from, yeah. That kind of uh, use of this machinery may not be possible in, in a, if not a similar case, another kind of, of, of case, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, which can occur. Mm -hmm. In other words, it, 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 the Human Rights Act um, greatly strengthens uh, the accountability right. of the British state, uh -huh. and it would be a step in the wrong direction for torture survivors mm -hmm. um, if, if that happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whether they were tortured abroad or within the UK is not really the concern. It's all just an example yeah. Yeah. Um, of how uh, the Human Rights Act was fundamental to increasing uh, the, the scope yeah. of, of human rights. Because otherwise, you know, this would have... this they would have got away with it. Thank you, Kevin, for those wonderful insights. And that was Pleasure. Talking Human Rights, um, where we've uh, discussed the whole uh, issue of uh, the Human Rights Act and gov UK government plans to scrap it.
And as we heard, there is going to be a consultation on this issue, and I hope that civil society will campaign against this move by the UK government. Thank you for joining us today.